You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. Now, whenever I talk to family, friends, loved ones, the list goes on and on. We often bring up COVID and we circle back to this one question. Will it ever end? It's been a little over two years since the first case of COVID-19 was reported, yet we're still dealing with breakthrough infections, new variants, and a health system that, depending on whom you talk to, is on the verge of collapse. Our guest today is a family doctor and her efforts to advocate not only for patients, but for the health and safety of all Ontarians has pushed her into the limelight. So what's it like being a doctor and an advocate? How do you cope with the online hate that comes from being outspoken online, especially when you're talking about vaccines? And how did we end up in a place where booster access is something that needs to be advocated for in general? Hi, my name is Takara Small. I'm sitting in for Jordan Heath Rawlings, and you're listening to The Big Story. Today I'm chatting with Dr. Nilly Kaplan Murth, an Ottawa based family physician, prolific social media user, and depending on how much news you consume, the woman who threatened to sue the province over its refusal to offer fourth doses to adults. Hello, Nilly. Hi, good morning. Good morning. It's really great to chat with you. So before the pandemic began, you were practicing as a family doctor. Did you ever imagine that you'd be thrust into the spotlight like this? No, it was not something that I had imagined at all. I'm now in beginning my 12th year of practice. Uh, At the time, I was doing daily advocacy for my patients Um, as all family doctors do. Uh, But I I did not imagine that I would then um, sort of enter the public sphere as an advocate. And what has that journey been like for you? It's actually been amazing uh, in some ways, and it's been very Mm -hmm. difficult in other ways. I feel like it's it's sort of like a, a growth also in my relationship with my own patients because they see me now in a slightly different light as well. And with the community, with Ottawa, I've taken on a a different role, which has been really nice to get to know other people in the community and other advocates in the community has been really great. And also getting to interact with and collaborate with uh, colleagues across Canada and internationally has been very cool. But on the downside, it's also come with a lot of harassment Mm -hmm. and um, death threats and um, just sort of there's a darker side to being a public face that is disturbing and disappointing. I have to ask about burnout, which is interesting because for those who are listening, we just did an episode on burnout, which you can listen to now. But you have your you know, day-to-day work, and then you have all of this other stuff on the side. I don't want to call it a side hustle because it's so much more, but how do you deal with that, especially in light of the fact that we're hearing about doctors, nurses, medical professionals who are experiencing acute stress and leaving the field altogether? Yeah, so here's the thing is that all of the advocacy I've done, all of the public speaking, all of the writing, all of that is actually energizing for me. Um, That is my antidote, if you will. It's my way of preventing burnout. If I were to just say, okay, everything is massively screwed up in healthcare and family doctors are being left out Mm -hmm. and we're all just doomed, I would quit. Like that would be, that would be my um, final straw in terms of burnout. Mm -hmm. If I feel like there's some hope, if I feel like, you know what, we can make some positive change, we can advocate successfully and get the things that we need, that gives me a sense of, okay, fine, I'll, I'll try doing this, you know, for another day or another week or another month. Um, so, I mean, burnout is extremely common because in family medicine, we are treated so badly. We are so disrespected, both by our leaders, as well as by the healthcare system. And even within our health organizations, uh, we've been left to fend for ourselves for so much of the time. 
You know, when I picked up the phone at the beginning of the pandemic and I phoned CBC, I said, we need to talk about family medicine. We need to talk about the community. And I did that because nobody else was going to do it. Nobody else was doing it. The Ontario Medical Association was not doing it. The Canadian Medical Association was not doing it. Our local organizations like the Departments of Family Medicine, not doing it. So I picked up the phone. I said, we need to talk. And I mean, for me, that is a way to feel like all hope is not lost. And speaking of hope, recently you've been focused on getting the Ontario government to open up booster access. Can you tell me a little bit about that and the position of the government has taken so far? So June 27th, I had planned a vaccine clinic to help get booster doses to all of the essential workers whom we had given boosters to back in December. Um, and, and then they were, you know, more than five, six, some, some people were even seven and eight months out from their last dose. Um, those were healthcare workers, they were grocers, they were construction workers, bus drivers, childcare providers, educators. We had planned to give 730 doses and the Ontario government phoned Ottawa Public Health and told them, Dr. kaplan Murth cannot do that. We have not authorized that. And public health phoned me and told me that. So then we had to cancel. And um, and again, rather than feeling defeated as in, okay, fine, these, these ridiculous policies that are preventing us from being able to protect ourselves are just going to have to be what we live with. Mm-hmm. Um, I reached out to a lawyer in Ottawa, Mark Bury, and he and I sent a letter to the Ontario Ministry and said, uh, we are giving you the opportunity to just do the right thing. Uh, if you can't just do the right thing, then we will either go to the Human Rights Tribunal or we'll go to court. Uh, And of course, we didn't hear back uh, from Ontario government. So then we uh, we had sent that to Sylvia Jones and to Doug Ford. And when we didn't hear back, um, then I reached out and we got Amira Adaran and Joanna Radboard, two other lawyers, um, to join me and Mark. And um, we had 70 plaintiffs and the lawyers started taking affidavits and we were going to go to court. And we were very public about that. And we had a fundraiser. Um, We raised more than $10,000 for possible court costs. Because even though the lawyers were willing to work pro bono, which means they weren't going to charge me any fees for doing their work, um, there can still be costs in court. Mm. Uh, So anyway, we had raised that money. We had all the plaintiffs that we needed. And we were very public about it. And I wrote an article in the Ottawa Citizen about what was going on. And then, um, lo and behold, Ontario approved boosters for everybody 18 and over and anyone 12 and over if they're immunocompromised. So, you know, ultimately we didn't have to go to court. I was able to return every cent of what uh, we raised to all the people who had donated to this fundraiser. And since then, people have been writing to me, um, sending me emails and DMs and messages to let me know that, you know, they are so thankful they've gone, they've gotten their boosters. And, you know, these are, these are like, doctors and nurses and dentists and like mm-hmm. people who should not have to beg to get um, a fourth dose. And um, so, you know, again, it's it's gratifying knowing that like we've helped people, but we shouldn't have had to fight so hard. It's ridiculous that for each of these things, we have to fight so hard. And I want to back up a little bit. Why was it so important to open up access for boosters? Why was that a critical part of your advocacy and pushing the Ontario government to provide that. Think back to the the beginning of the pandemic, what we were seeing in New York City, in Italy, what we were seeing around the world, we were seeing body bags. We were seeing uh, people who worked in hospitals and in clinics dying. We were seeing seniors dying. We were seeing young, healthy people dying of COVID. The reason that we are alive The reason that I, as a family doctor, am comfortable seeing patients in person in my office is because we've since been able to access this amazing vaccine. The vaccine does not prevent COVID, but it does help to reduce serious illness, hospitalization, death. It probably also helps to reduce the likelihood of long COVID. It probably also, to some extent, although we don't have good data, but it probably also helps to prevent transmissibility of COVID. So the protection that was offered to us back in December, that protection was waning. And um, so for the same reasons that people were literally crying in my office, tears of joy when they were first able to access the vaccine, um, those same people are asking to be able to have a booster so that they have continued protection 
We know that there uh, is work being done on another vaccine, the bivalent vaccine. Currently, we have no vaccine at our disposal that will help specifically targeting BA4 and 5, those strains of COVID. There's work that's still being done on that. Uh, The government talks about the fall, but in fact, when they refer to the fall, they mean maybe November, probably more like the winter. Interesting. Okay. Some people are like, well, should I hold off and wait? Well, if you hold off and wait for a booster that is more specific, first of all, they haven't even developed the booster that's specific for BA4 or 5 yet. The one that they have is for a strain BA1-2, which is not necessarily going to be any more helpful than what we currently have. And by the time they have a, a newer a vaccine. We have to see what the dominant strain is. And and that could be, like I said, it could be um, well into November or beyond. And then they're going to, again, have their priority lists. And again, as anybody under the age of 65 is the most likely person to be working out there in um, jobs that we have less protection. So, uh, you know, Ontario dropped mask mandates, you know, shame on them. They got rid of masks that would have helped to protect people from spreading COVID and uh, all of those workplaces where people don't necessarily have good sick leave and where people are pushed back to work after only five days, they're no longer wearing masks. So it's crazy. So at least with the vaccine, you have some protection against the serious illness until we can access another vaccine maybe in November or so. We're also emphasizing that a vaccine on its own isn't enough. People should be masking indoors. And in my medical office, we, are, we have maintained a mask mandate and we are allowed to do so. In places though, like grocery stores or my son who brought home COVID from working in a hardware store. Like if everybody walks into a shop unmasked, they're going to give COVID to everybody else in that shop as well as to the people who work there. And that is not good for anyone's health. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for the healthcare system. So um, we should be using all of those tools and we're not. And and that really is a policy failure. And as you mentioned, boosters are now available to residents in Ontario, actually anyone in Ontario, correct? Yeah, no, any, uh, anybody 18 and over or anyone 12 and over if they are immunocompromised. So um, that 12 to 17 year old group can also get it if, if they're immunocompromised. And it was already available in Quebec for anybody 18 and over. And it was already available um, in other Uh, I think New Brunswick had opened it up before Ontario did. Um, People were going to the States, but it should never be a a matter of privilege. And that's one of the things that I've said in my advocacy throughout the pandemic. It shouldn't be a privilege to have basic safety. So the people who are most disadvantaged are the people who are poor, who have to rely on public transportation, who don't have paid sick days, who don't have a way to um, isolate themselves. They can't just go up to you know, a cottage or work from home and drive around in their own cars. And like people who don't have those privileges are out there interacting with other people and and they're at risk. And women have also disproportionately been affected throughout the pandemic. Um, The number of families where uh, a woman is reinfected again and again because her children are bringing it home from daycare or from school and um, and women are also disproportionately nurses, and we are educators, and we are childcare providers, and personal support workers, and family doctors too. So the the number of ways in which we have been repeatedly disadvantaged throughout the pandemic is um, is pretty pathetic, and we need to we need to keep up the advocacy because there is truly nobody who's looking out for us. Instead, it's the big box stores and the big corporations and the people with money who um, are getting what they want. They have access to testing if they want to pay for PCR tests, if they, you know, private schools had rapid tests when public schools didn't. All of the ways in which our society has vulnerable populations, those vulnerable populations are more adversely affected by COVID as well. Nilly, you've touched on something 
that I've been thinking about for quite a bit, and it has to do with public messaging. So yes, the the booster was available in Quebec, but it wasn't available in Ontario. And for the last two years, we've been told, again, the general public, to trust medical professionals, to trust public health. But how can individuals do that when the advice changes from province to province and someone on the other side of the country might be able to access a booster while well, you can't? How can individuals discern what's important, what's not in their day to day lives? Yeah. So that's, that is a really good question. And the simple answer is that if our governments had been transparent, if we had had clear messaging throughout that COVID is airborne, and if we had continued to provide data on how many infections are out there in the community, people might have been able to make informed decisions about how to behave. But instead, the government messaging across Canada and for sure in Ontario has been really wishy-washy. When we were trying to get people to give their children their uh, second doses of the pediatric COVID vaccine, it kind of overlapped with Ontario making announcements, okay, fine, COVID's over, take off your masks, who cares? Well, surprise, surprise, people didn't get their kids their second doses. When people are out in the streets you know, Ottawa having been occupied by anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers. And instead of reporting on the ways in which misinformation and disinformation is being pushed by a far-right, anti-democratic, hate-fueled group of people, the media reports on it as though there's any kind of validity to anything that those anti-vaxxers are saying. Just yesterday, CBC ran an article talking about how, uh, you know, maybe with repeated infections, we'll all be okay. I saw that. And like, that is so irresponsible. So, you know, what is the public supposed to do with that? And what is the public supposed to do when, you know, we used to be able to say, okay, well, at least we could report on numbers of people infected with COVID. And that would give people a sense of how much danger there was in their community. But we can't do that anymore. We can literally only rely on the poop. We can rely on the wastewater levels to tell us, uh, is COVID going up or is it not? We can't rely on how many people are in the ICU. That's a lagging indicator. And it's also an indicator that doesn't represent how many people are being reinfected and are going to have long COVID, but aren't ending up in hospital. And as a family doctor, those are the patients that I see. I see patients who are still struggling to breathe. They can't walk down the street without being short of breath. They have brain fog. They have headaches. They have all kinds of long-term sequelae of having had COVID. And nobody is collecting that data. Nobody is saying, actually, you know what? You want to do your darndest to avoid getting COVID because it's not mild. It's not a joke. It can have serious repercussions. So we have an information void. And then we have this powerful thing that is this disinformation machinery. It's like a organized attempt to undermine good information with bad information. So that is really destructive. And uh, Canadian media needs to address it. Misinformation minimizers, people who are spreading disinformation about COVID or about anything else are actually causing harm. So you know, we have we have to reckon with that. We have to understand that sometimes it's not that there are two points of view. Sometimes there's just data. There's just information that needs to get out there clearly, transparently, without layers of opinion, politics, just the raw data. And in this case, the raw data would be how many people are getting sick, how many people have long COVID, how many people are unable to go to work because of COVID, like the the hospital in Perth that was closed because of COVID outbreaks among staff. I cannot imagine how, on the one hand, people can still be in the media saying COVID is no big deal. And yet we have hospital emergency departments that are closed because all the staff have COVID. That is a big deal. We need to stop with the baloney of saying, We need to express all opinions and we need to just give the public the information which actually helps to protect them. 
And you referenced long COVID. Sometimes it's known as long haul COVID or post acute COVID. But what that really means are people who have been infected with the virus and then have a range of ongoing health problems, fatigue, um, um, loss of motor skills, brain fog, all of those things. And, you know, what you just mentioned, you've also shared online as well through social media. You've shared with the public um, how to avoid COVID and and what the infection can do to your body, which has resulted in a lot of attention from, you know, what we would consider trolls. How do you deal with that? How do you manage that? So there are different levels of trolls. Um, There's the person who sent a death threat to me. Uh, through the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario that we reported to the police and um, the police did nothing. Of course, that was back in the days before Ottawa was occupied and the police also did nothing when Ottawa was occupied. So um, no big surprise there. We are still pursuing a restraining order against the person who sent the death threat. And it turns out, according to the Crown prosecutors, that this person who sent me the death threat actually already has somebody else who has a him on a restraining order and he has a criminal record. So these are potentially actually dangerous people. These aren't just the 8,000 plus people that I've blocked on Twitter because they are trolls who just are rude, disparaging. They're often sexist. They're often anti-Semitic. They are often bigoted. They like to comment on my being Jewish, on my being a woman. They comment on the fact that I use he, she pronouns. You know, like those people, there are so many of them and, you know, you, you block them and yet there are still more. Um, but I mean, all you can do is block them. Then there are the people who phone my office and leave messages swearing at me and just saying the most awful things. And that's something that, again, is often tinged with sexism and racism. And when I was first confronted with the death threat, uh, Catherine Smart, the president of the Canadian Medical Association, was just working with um, the government of Canada on new legislation that would make any form of harassment of uh, healthcare workers illegal. But even though that law came into, into force, there's still actually no way to enforce it if the police don't take our complaints seriously, because somebody has to charge these people. And, uh, you know, when I say that there are people who you know, phone our office and swear and they're horrible. I mean, like that's abusive, not only to me, but also to my staff. Mm -hmm. She has to listen to that garbage in the mornings when she's trying to get messages from patients who actually need care. But then there are the other trolls and the other people who make um, vexatious complaints to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And what a waste of time and energy for the college and for doctors having to deal with that. The doctors who are spreading disinformation, are legitimately being sanctioned by the CPSO, as they should be. Uh, but when when somebody who's just an anti-vaxxer complains to the CPSO and then the CPSO has to uh, assign somebody to write that up and then it ends up being thrown out. But it's a bloody waste of time and it's a stressful thing for the doctors who are doing good work out there. So um, that's just something I, I never imagined. Like when I picked up the phone to phone CBC to say we needed to, to talk about family medicine and community, I never imagined that it would also um, result in having to deal with this kind of uh, just vexatious rudeness and and horrible people. And how do you perceive the future then? Because you've mentioned you're working not just as a family physician, but also advocating for better access to vaccines, to boosters, to PPE. How do you stay hopeful when it comes to the future? I kind of take it day by day. I mean, last last year, this time of year, last July, August, I was starting to uh, run Safe September advocacy campaigns. We held a um, meeting in Ottawa and invited MPPs to come and speak with us about planning for a safe September. And then we went to Queen's Park and did it with MPPs in Toronto as well. An incredible panel of colleagues came together and we talked about like, these are the things, the basic things that we should be doing to make schools safer. Uh, do I have the energy to do that again this summer? Like, not really. You know, and, and it starts to feel 
that starts to feel um, Sisyphean. We are pushing this boulder up a hill and they're just going to push it right back down again. They're not going to make any changes. They're not going to move forward with basic um, safety protocols. I spent a lot of time last year going to um, school board meetings, not just for the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, but for other school boards as well, uh, to speak as an advocate for masks in classrooms because it shouldn't only be the vulnerable kids who are wearing masks. That's not how masks work. It should be everybody. But, you know, you you, you just kind of eventually, you, you just feel like, okay, fine, I give up. If everyone just wants to be selfish, if everybody wants to just only do what is going to suit their own particular needs and wants in that moment, um, I, you know, there's not really that much more that, that we can do. Uh, so I sort of oscillate between trying to help and then feeling like, okay, fine, like I give up. Um, I have a book that's coming out, University of Toronto Press is publishing Breaking Canadians. And Breaking Canadians is going to be a really amazing collection of stories. It's written by many of the key healthcare advocates across Canada, as well as stories by patients and caregivers across Canada, uh, their experiences of the pandemic, and also beyond the pandemic, issues in terms of the healthcare system. Uh, so, you know, I have to choose which things I'm going to put my energy into. And next weekend, July 24th, I'm running a big jab of Palooza. Uh, we have given more than 17,000 doses of COVID vaccine already to people in Ottawa. We're going to be seeing another thousand people next weekend to help them get their boosters. I can do that. I've got a team of incredible volunteers from the, around the city who come and help. So like there are certain things I can do, but I have to also say that while all of this has been going on, I've also had to be fighting for my own office to survive. I've had to fight with the Ministry of Health about their models of funding for family doctors. I have had to fight to be allowed to keep my office where it is and to join another group of doctors um, without having to move my office. And, um, and there are days when that is just so depressing because it's ongoing. And as, as it stands, the ministry is so slow it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to be in a model where I have any kind of um, support or stability until November of 2022. Um, that is so depressing. But I can't always say how depressing it is publicly because my patients follow me and the public looks to me for encouragement. They want to hear messages of hope. They want to hear positive work that we're doing. They don't really want to hear that, yeah, you know, if this doesn't work out, I am closing my practice and I am abandoning my 1,200 patients, just like all the other doctors who've just left downtown Ottawa and said, screw this, I'm not doing it anymore. So um, so it's a balance. Like I try to be positive. I try to find the things that we can do that are constructive and that help to feel hopeful. But the other side of it is there is a huge struggle day to day where you're just like, well, okay, fine. If people want to be that stupid, if they want to just say, we don't care. We'd rather gather together, you know, hundreds of thousands of people without masks. And we don't care how many hospitals close. And we don't care how many healthcare workers get sick. And we don't care how many kids end up with long COVID or how many adults. And if that's the general public attitude, you know, as a doctor, like I care about my patients, but also I can't move mountains if, if the public is going to just refuse to take things seriously and the media is going to refuse to report responsibly, then what more can I do? I want to ask this one question, and it might be actually a great place to leave the conversation. And that is, what advice do you have for Canadians who are listening to this episode and they are worried, they're concerned about the new wave, uh, new variants, and they're not sure how to protect themselves? So the simplest advice, the most straightforward advice that I could give to any Canadian is to understand COVID is airborne. Just like if somebody was smoking in a room, you can still smell it even if you're across the room, even after that person has left the room. For hours later, you're at risk if you're around people and you're not masked and they're not masked and there isn't good ventilation. You're at risk of severe illness. You're at risk of hospitalization. You're at risk of dying and you are at risk of long COVID. Every time you get COVID, that risk goes down if you've had all the boosters that are available to you. In terms of vaccine, uh, there's going to be from province to province, there's still differences in terms of what is available. In Ontario, 
If it's been more than six months, more than five months, your protection from your previous vaccine has waned. So governments say, speak to your doctor, but there are hundreds of thousands of people who don't have a doctor. I can't give every individual medical advice. I can only give medical advice to my own patients. But people need to know to be informed. COVID is all around. We have patients of every age from little newborns to 90-year-olds who are getting COVID. And some of those people, especially if they have not had their COVID vaccine boosters, some of those people are going to get seriously ill. A large number of those people are going to suffer long-term disability, even if what they experience at the time is not so severe that they end up in hospital, they could still end up with long-term consequences of getting COVID. So it's, it's really best to be um, aware that COVID's around you. Wear an N95 mask if you can get one. If you can't get one, there are organizations that are donating them and they don't have to be fit to a person. I wear an N95 mask every day in my office. It's not been fit to me, but it is comfortable. I can wear it for 12 hours straight. And so could any other adult in any other workplace setting or going out to do other activities. So, um, you know, you need to you need to proceed with knowing that that COVID is very much still here and um, and that we do have tools at our disposal to help reduce the risk of getting COVID and the seriousness of COVID when you do get it. This has been incredibly informative. Thank you again for joining us. You're very welcome. Take care. And that was my conversation with Dr. Neely Kaplan-Mirth for The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN, or talk to us anytime via email at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can also call us at 416-935-5935. I'm Takara Small, sitting in for Jordan Heath Rawlings this week, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.